Welcome to the Abyssinian syllabary, where we spell out Ethiopia in 33 characters. I'm Yves Marie Stranger, your host and the compiler of these Abyssinian lives. Nota bene. While any resemblance to actual countries, past or present, and to historical figures is not purely coincidental, this is a work of fiction. For a primer on these Ethiopian characters, newcomers may start with the prologue by Manuel de Goes. To order the book or a poster of the Abyssinian syllabary, visit uthiopia.com. That's U-T-H-I-O-P-I-A dot com. Prepare for the worst, and when the best appears, you shall appreciate it all the more. Receive this best with joy while conversant that it is a prelude to defeat. And grasp, finally, that the worst and the best are necessary oscillations, just as there cannot be a one-sided injera galette. The Apocrypha of Zereacob Berhana Mugese Ah! Her mother was a chingarad, that is to say, a thigh servant, of the Bahar Nagash's head of a hundred, who had lost his own head, having had it docked just nine months previously while stalking slaves in the borderlands, so that speculation grew, together with the thigh servant's belly, that Muntuab was the Bahar Nagash's natural child, and that he had purposely disposed of his head of a hundred. Muntuab, she who was later to be called Berana Mugese, was birthed at the court of this Bahar Nagash, the sea lord, in his Debarawa palace, a flat-topped hadio some four days' route from the shores of the Red Sea. The sea lord, if he were made privy to the tittle-tattle, saw nothing to be abashed about, and even stoked the gossip with the loving kindness he lavished on the girl-child, and by the many gusha of choice cuts he placed in her mouth on feast days. Muntuab, the sea lord would exclaim, how beautiful you are to behold, so that such became the name she was to bear her entire life. Muntuab was coltish and of a light brown skin tone, such as a baraka coffee immixed with acacia honey. She displayed golden sparks in the orbs of her eyes and there were towel-coloured reflections in the long hair that she wore plaited in the latest fashion of the court of the Tigre Mahon. She was vivacious like a polecat, and forever at play with her companions, Maharet, Miriam, and Medin, at the things that have the affection of little girls, rag and straw dolls and such, while with the boys, Brooke, Emmanuel, and Gebri Medin, she played Abyssinian hopscotch. Muntuad's life took a turn when the sea lord rode out to meet his own denouement in a dispute bearing on a few tracts of the land on the wrong side of the Mareb River. He had departed with just three horsemen to conclude once and for all the disagreement, which was indeed resolved, just not as he had foreseen. After riding till noon, the sea lord and his men sought out the shade of a chola tree, an altogether woeful idea, as it was here that the baria, melting down onto them from the crown of the tree, slit their throats from ear to ear. Before taking his leave, the Bahar Nagash had placed slight Muntuab on his knee, urgently imparting to her, You are a pip of the Burtukan. Do not forget, your ancestors were Portuguese from across the seas. Those that stopped the bogeyman Grani, and safeguarded the kingdom of Abyssinia forevermore. And, with these words, her father had ridden off to never return. Muntuab grew long-legged and very handsome, with those golden reflections in her hair. This head of gold she owed to the conjunction of a Mozarab from Tarifa and a red-headed Galician of this she was never to know, although neither did she ever forget the parting words of the Bahar Nagash on her Burtukan genesis. Muntuab 
was carried away as booty at the time of the scrimmages that ensued her father's passing between a Falasha Ras from the Simeon and an Arabized chieftain from the Mutswa lowlands, who each had set their whetted appetites on the strip between Aksum and the coast. It is this Ras from the Simeon who tottered her away to his cold kingdom, where flowers blossomed on chafts at three men's height from the ground, and where apes cropped grass like sheep in the paddocks. In these lands, even the jackals were red-coloured coals, so as to better keep their heat. The man was clumsy, and was not a bad sort, even though he called himself a Jew, so that she gave him her affections, because she had a loving heart, and because it was so chilly. Here, Muntuab spent two gelid years, before being ceded as part of the annual tribute to the king of kings in his castle of Dembea. The harvest had been poor that year, cut short by hail and snow, and she had caught the eye of the Dejazmach sent out from Gondar to drum up some revenue for his liege. She was a sorrowful, a little, but not too much, to leave these crags. And, after seven days atop a mule, through the vales and over the hills, upon reaching her destination, Muntuab knew at once that she had reached the place. Gondar was in these times a buoyant city, and its embattled walls, rendered white by the drying of the royal linens, seemed at all times to be aloft on a sea of mist. The corner towers were surmounted with russet domes that were likened to partridge eggs. Green, yellow and red banners fluttered atop the towers in the wind. In the distance, one could make out the white foam around the papyrus floats that shuttled between the monastic islands of Lake Tanna. This was a town awaiting its queen. Muntuab quickly learned the art of making friends in the woman's quarters. The provincial girl of cracked lips was transformed overnight into the princess that the city and its king had been unknowingly expecting. The plaything of one night, she was made third concubine by the morning. Her rubicund pigmentation, her long auburn hair, and even more so her resolute demeanour, together with a solid dose of common sense and an absolute absence of personal interest, had earned her the prize sought by all, and which she herself had never rooted for. She became the queen, Baranagast, of an intrepid king. Then, upon becoming a widow after only two years, the regent of a prince in swaddling clothes. Muntuab was as loved by her friends as she was feared by her foes, a virtuous and austere queen, a builder of palaces as well as an able administrator of the state. She was to rule glorious Gondar and its varied kingdoms during forty prosperous years. Her writ ran from her original province of Bahar Nagash by way of the snowy mountains of the Simeon to the southern provinces where they smear themselves in blood and clotted milk. Muntuab came to embody the kingdom itself, and she not seldom repeated to James Bruce, who spent several years at her court during the 1770s, that Ethiopia and I, we are at one. As a majestic woman much advanced in years, she liked to poke fun at the gruff Scotsman cockatishly avowing to him, Do you not see my complexion? You and I, we are segments of the same fruit. Mm -hmm.